sincerely thank you for this blessed privilege. Um, it means a lot <laughs> to me. Um, you know, it really is a, a, a joy, a joy to be here with you. And uh, I hope, I hope that uh, I can, uh, by God's grace, uh, be used. You know, in some way to bring encouragement to you. Um, it is, uh, it is hard sometimes to live. The life in this uh, day and age that we live in, um, and it's the scriptures that uh, we turn to, uh, to to show us how to live uh, the life. So this morning, I'd like you to think about um, maybe you have heard of uh, something called the bridge that goes to nowhere. Um, it was talked about a lot back in the late '90s, I believe maybe early 2000s. Um, there, in fact, it's a phrase that you can find uh, different applications for it. Right? There's probably more than one bridge that goes to nowhere in this world, but uh, there's one that's very famous that exists uh, near Ketch Ketchewan, Alaska. And apparently, I've never been there, but there's an island that the airport is on for that area, on a little island. And uh, so it was proposed that they spend about $300 million to build something that was going to be uh, greater than the Golden Gate Bridge. And they started the bridge and they put millions and millions of dollars into the bridge. And uh, then I think it was in 2005, somewhere around there, Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast. And for various reasons, the whole project was scrapped. And they just left this bridge uh, not complete. And uh, I'm not sure if it ever was completed. I tried to find out this way, <laughs> if maybe somebody here knows. But as far as I know, I could find no nothing, uh, at least Google could not help me find anything that says that it was really completed. Uh, so it began as a really good idea that would help people, you know, with tra transportation there in that area of the world, uh, but there wasn't enough uh, funds to really make it happen at that time. So as we look at the teaching of the scriptures about the sacrifice of Jesus, and, and, and I want you to think about it this way, it could it possibly be a bridge to nowhere, a halfway bridge, or is it a full bridge? Is it a full salvation, a complete salvation, a thorough salvation, a great salvation? <laughs> I think you can tell from the way I'm speaking that there's, there's obviously one answer to that. It isn't. Jesus' death on the cross is not a bridge to nowhere. It's not a halfway measure that God somehow uh, began uh, and then left it to us somehow or somehow for us to figure out how to continue to make that, uh, you know, to make that crossing. So we've been talking about uh, the whole idea of this acrostic called the tulip. And, uh, you know, we, we, we spent some time talking about the depravity of human beings. The T in the tulip is, stands for total depravity. And it means that we are all sinners and we can't save ourselves. We can't possibly uh, in ourselves uh, you know, merit salvation. That, that's, that's most Christians in some sense, I would say, in some sense would agree with what I just said. But the Reformed idea is that we are so, so totally depraved that every part of our nature has been affected by sin that no matter what we do, we always, uh, that, uh, that, that sinful part of us is always engaged. We can, never, we can never do anything in and of our natural state that can merit God's, uh, you know, God's uh, satisfaction with us, right? So then we had the unconditional election, which is the you in Tulip. So if man, and if, if we are all lost in sin, if we are all, um, in a situation in which we cannot possibly save ourselves, if we cannot do that. In fact, if we cannot even do the first thing that in the eyes of God, that uh, 
is totally, is totally just or right because everything that we do, everything we are, is always tainted by sin, contaminated by sin in some way, so that we cannot merit God's you know, favor. God had to take the initiative to save us. We could not save ourselves. And so when we look at the scripture, we see the scripture teaching us that God took that initiative to save us, uh, you know, beginning before the foundation of the world, that God took that initiative uh, to uh, choose to save some, some sinners out of the mass of fallen humanity, even before uh, the foundation of the world, before we were born. And so we have all kinds of scriptures that make that abundantly plain. The whole idea of grace, the whole idea of grace, undeserved favor from God, um, undeserved merit from God. Um, hinges on that, that God is the one that takes the initiative. And the scriptures say he took that initiative long before we knew about his plan. Um, and so this morning, I want to spend some time talking about what is the L in the tulip, and that is limited atonement many times. But maybe a better way to say it <laughs> is definite atonement or particular atonement. In other words, this view says, yes, we can't save ourselves. Yes, God, by his grace, has to save us. And he took that initiative long before we even understood what his plan was. And when Christ died on the cross, he didn't die in some generic way, like a bridge, you know, that goes nowhere. A halfway bridge that crosses some of the no territory, but Christ's death on the cross totally saved, not just possibility of saving, his death on the cross totally is sufficient to save us and deliver us from our sins so that it's not some kind of uh, generic salvation that Christ purchased on the cross. And you know, some of you may be thinking, well, what does this have to matter? <laughs> it does. You just wait. If, just wait and see. I hope I can show you that. I'm going to do my best to show you it matters. It matters a lot. Jesus didn't die in some generic way. Jesus died in a specific way. He died for specifically his, his people when he died. And he actually purchased salvation for his people, and he actually saved them by his death on the cross. It wasn't uh, just a halfway measure. And so, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's, not, it's not a halfway measure. So Jesus saved us by his atonement, and uh, we, we see in this text that has been read from John 10, we can see that in this text really clearly said in so many different ways that many times we just kind of read it through and we're not really thinking through what is it that the Lord Jesus is really saying here. So it's an, it's an allegory here that he's talking about himself as the good shepherd. And he's using this to confront the Pharisees following the healing of the man born blind. So Jesus is probably rooting this allegory in what the Old Testament said, you know, because why was that important? Okay, what do, what do you pastors always go back to a, a, a verse somewhere, you know, in the Old Testament when you're preaching? Because there is, you know, just like uh, Charlie was saying here, there's this covenant and it's like God unfolding his purposes to save his people through the generations. And so what he begins in the Old Testament, he follows through, right, in the New Testament. So there's unity between Old and New Testament in that what begins in the Old Testament actually uh, comes to fruition around the person and work of Christ in the New Testament. So here, Jesus is showing us that. Jesus is showing us, again, how important the Scripture is, right? Have you ever thought about how often the Lord Jesus quotes the Scriptures? He quotes the Scriptures 
almost with every breath. He quotes when he's on the cross, for instance, as he's, as he's in agony on the cross. Everything that he said was rooted in the scriptures. This tells us how Jesus considered the scriptures, right? Everything about the scriptures was how he thought. So here we can see from Ezekiel 34 uh, there, uh, verse 2, for instance, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Shall not the shepherds feed the flock? So, so there's this background in the Old Testament for what the Lord is saying here. Notice what he says. I am the shepherd, the good one. That's how it reads in the Greek. I am the shepherd. It's out of order for our English. I am uh, the shepherd, the good one. And it's interesting, the Greek word, there's several Greek words for good. One Greek word, uh, ag agathos, means morally good, like, like uh, upright or righteous good, right? But Jesus is not using that word here. He's using a word that's in the Greek is kalos, which means excellent, um, uh, authentic, um, genuine. Um, he's, he's saying not only that, it has to do with beautiful in that it is, it's, it's the right, <laughs> it's the right one, right? It's the, it's the epitome of what a good shepherd should be. Jesus is saying, I am the genuine, real shepherd. I am the, I am the preeminent shepherd of all shepherds, he's saying. And and so what he's saying here is that, you know, this is the way it should be. You know, he is the one, and he is the only one. In, fa in fact, if we spent a lot of time on this, we won't. The, the, whole, the whole phrase, I am the good shepherd, or the, the shepherd, the good one. The word I am is, of course, from the Old Testament, too. It was the personal name of God in the Old Testament. Moses before the burning bush. Uh, who shall uh, I say sent me to? You know, to, he says, I am that I am. And so the Lord Jesus has several statements in the New Testament in which he uses that as a way to assert his divinity, that he isn't just uh, simply man, but he's truly God. I am the beautiful, the perfect, the, the example, the, the, uh, <laughs> the original, the, the, the perfect shepherd, he's saying here. And so he's, he's going to say a lot about that as time goes on, and we could learn a lot about what a shepherd or a pastor should be. The real pastor is the one who cares for the sheep. He is the one that uh, not only oversees them to protect them and feed them, uh, he is the one that supplies everything that they need. And Jesus is a perfect example of that. But I'd like you to see how oftentimes in this text, he's saying this in a personal way, not just in a generic way. He's, he makes many statements here about the, the definite, particular, the certain um, relationship that he has to his sheep. For instance, when you look at that text in verses 10, uh, I mean, chapter 10, verses 4 through 6, he leads his sheep. In other words, he has a flock. It, it, they, these are his sheep, and he leads them, and he guards them. We see that in verses 10 through 10, uh, 7 through 10. He dies for his sheep. And there you go in verses 11 through 18. And as a result uh, of that, uh, the sheep hear his voice. You see, it's, it, it, his sheep recognize the sound of his voice. Now, I, I don't know much about sheep, <laughs> but I know that animals become 
connected to the person that cares for them. I know that like for one of my sons has, uh, has some horses and he has uh, chickens and he has, he has pigs and he has, anyway, he's livestock. When he starts walking down there, it doesn't matter what time of day, when he walks out in the field and he comes close to the, to the edge of the fence, they come over immediately because they know him and they know that he's the guy that's going to feed them. And so they're right there, right? And, and you know that with pets, right? If, if I came into your house and you have a dog, there's a good chance that dog's going to react in a negative way or it's going to be guarded or it's going to bark or whatever. But when you come over to your own dog, that dog recognizes you. Uh, it recognizes that connection. So, so, you know, here he says the sheep really knows uh, knows uh, the shepherd. They hear his voice and they respond to him and they're called by, uh, by name in verse 3 of chapter 10. In other words, that he knows each one of their names. Yeah, so, so I don't know. Uh, my, my son, again, with his livestock, he has a name for every one of them. <laughs> and they know their name. So when he calls their name, they know that he's talking. He knows, they know they come. And, and so he's, there's this connection, this personal connection that you see here. And not only that, they follow him because they know his voice. And he's saying, you know, very clearly here that um, they will be saved and will go in and out and find pastures. Verse 9, that's again to his sheep. And, you know, he will have, they will have life and will have it abundantly, according to John 10.10. 10. They know him and are known by him, uh, John 10.14, and will become, and, and there will be one flock, one group, right, of his, uh, verse 16. So here we see the specific design of the relationship of the Lord to his people. And we see the definite relationship that he has to his people. And he's making this, these comments about how he's laying down his life specifically for his sheep. He has such a depth of commitment to these sheep that he would forfeit his life to save them. And, you know, so what comfort that should be for us. You know, we read that, but if we're one of the sheep, <laughs> if we're one of the the Lord's, then it isn't some kind of generic relationship. You know, I'm a, I'm a member of, I had to, I had to do my membership uh, dues uh, last, I think it was last night. I had to pay my membership dues, okay, for this organization that I'm part of, uh, you know, American Association for Marriage and Family Therapists. I've got, I, I don't really particularly want to be part of that, but you can't do what I do without being part of that. But, you know, they send me an email and I send them their money and they say, thank you very much. And I'm telling you, that's about as deep as that relationship is. <laughs> it's not much more than that. And there's all kinds of things like that today. And so we, we have a tendency to be like that sometimes about relationships. We, we don't have, uh, in it, and we, we just, we live in a time when that type of thing that I just described is really not that unusual. There probably are lots of things like that that you can think of about you. And, and so what does this matter? Let me propose one. It matters because the relationship we have to the Lord Jesus Christ is a personal. Yes, it really is very personal. Christ knows me as his own. Christ didn't just come to die in some generic way uh, that didn't have any particular relationship to me. No, there's a loving bond and a relationship between the Lord and his people. And as Jesus laid down his life on the cross, he didn't just lay down his, his life in some kind of uh, 
you know, general way and thinking, you know, not really even having an awareness in his heart or his life of who these people may possibly be that he's dying for. Remember, we're talking about um, the Son of God. We're, we're talking about someone equal in power and glory with God. He, he knows, ultimately, Jesus knows all things. He knows everything. The, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He knows all things. He didn't die in some kind of generic way without any, uh, you know, any design for anyone in a personal sense. And so what a comfort is that? that he knows his own, that he knows you, and that he, you know, that he died for you, not just in a generic way. It, I mean, how could we build, how could we have this loving relationship <laughs> to Jesus if Jesus was like that organism, you know, okay? It's like this generic thing, okay? I'm a citizen of the state of Tennessee, all right? So, Yes, I have a voter registration thing that I've got to dig out, right? <laughs> the state knows me. <laughs> I would hope, you know, and, and as we look at Scripture, it certainly is a hope well-founded that my relationship to the living God, to the Lord Jesus Christ, when he, when he bled and died on Calvary, that he wasn't just uh, dying in some kind of... Uh, you know, uh, not knowing who, who, who these people would be. And so the Bible's true teaching on the design of Christ's atonement is there is certainly a specific, particular, definitive, personal design to the atonement. And we see that highlighted all through Scripture. Matthew 121, for instance, He's talking to Mary, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then John 15, uh, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Or Acts 20, 28. Take heed unto the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for it. Yeah, it, <laughs> very personal relationship. John 17.9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them. This is Jesus which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Uh, and then 19 and 20 of that chapter. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, and they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. And then Hebrews 9:28. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin for those who eagerly uh, await him. So if, uh, if Christ died for all sins of all people, then why, uh, why aren't all people saved? <laughs> If he paid the price, if you understand it, he paid the price for all sins of all people, then why would anyone not be saved? But the fact is that uh, you might say, well, because they don't believe. Well, is belief a sin? <laughs> and did Jesus die for that sin too of unbelief? Or if you look at it this way, that... Um, he died for some of the sins of some people. Well, what does that lead to? If he died for some sins of some people, then that means that no one is truly saved <laughs> because we can't go to heaven based on some of our sins being forgiven, right? And others not. But the truth is that he died specifically for his people. For those who trust in him, you say, well, who, how can we ever know who those people are? 
If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, according to Romans 10. So if you trust in the living Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, if you turn from your sins and trust in him, and I plead with you today, that is what the scripture says. That's, that's how we receive Christ, is we repent and turn to Christ, believe in him. If we do that, we, are, we have every... Uh, we have every reason to have assurance that he will not uh, turn away from us, that we are his people. So uh, Christ saved us by his atonement. So I'm not pleading with you to receive Christ that you may potentially be saved. Yeah, receive Christ, you might be saved. You know, No, that's no good, right? We wouldn't, what kind of gospel is that? What kind of good news is that to say that Jesus died in a way to just open an opportunity uh, to give the potential for salvation? And I'm not trying to get you to believe in him as a great opportunity. I am not, uh, I'm not declaring to you a savior who may not really be able to save you. What good would that be? What kind of gospel would that be? No. I'm calling on you. I'm, I'm asking, and I mean, okay, so I'm preaching, and sometimes people think, okay, that's what preachers do, right? So I'm going to say it. I am not just preaching here, okay? And when I say that, I have a very high view of preaching. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I am trying to tell you, this is really, 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 really important. This is the most important, and I don't want you to miss it under any circumstances. I'm calling on you to turn from your sins and to receive and trust Christ. Christ paid the penalty for the sins of his people. And if you trust in him, you will never be put to shame. If we trust and believe in him, we have eternal life, the scripture says. That's what Jesus says. He says, you know, if we believe in him, if we trust in him, we will have eternal life. Not just, well, I hope you'll get it, but I can't tell you, you know, you might or might not. No, there is, uh, you know, we can have eternal life today through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ because Christ paid the entire penalty for our sins. He laid down his life for his people. He purchased our redemption by his precious blood. He reconciled us to God. He didn't just open a possibility up for salvation. He, Christ saves sinners that trust in him. And that is good news. And there's nothing better than that. Can you think of anything better than that? That our salvation is secure because our Savior died for us and he rose again for our justification. He died for me on the cross. Right? Can you say that in your heart, hearts? He died for me on the cross. He didn't just die in some generic way. He purchased my salvation by his precious blood. And so he, he did. What he, what he set out to do is not a bridge to nowhere. It's not a halfway bridge. It's a whole salvation because his salvation was purchased by his own blood. So then serve him. Right? If you know him and you understand how glorious and wonderful it is that he keeps his promises, that if we repent of our sins and trust in him, we have eternal life. So he's worthy of service. So you say, ah, oh, worship, I don't know. Just hard to come to worship. <laughs> uh, you know, hard to, hard to uh, you know, it's a delight to be in the house of the Lord. It's a delight to learn the scriptures and it's a delight to be with God's people and this is the view that follows the exact meaning of the whole scriptures that Christ's salvation is complete so as Paul says in Galatians 2 20 I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I live but Christ who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me 
who loved me and gave himself up for me. So what confidence we should have as we draw near to God, that he will receive <laughs> sinners such as we are and have mercy on us, and he will save us because he keeps his word and because his son has paid the price. So I would say, <laughs> you know, if you don't know him today, turn to him with all of your heart and trust in him and believe him and trust what he did on the cross to save you and know that what he did is totally sufficient to save you to the uttermost. It's not a bridge to nowhere. It's not a halfway finished salvation. He did not die for nothing or no one. He died for me and I trust he died for you and so live for him and follow him he is a glorious wonderful loving savior let's pray father we love you we thank you for the finished work of jesus we ask you for grace to uh, rest in the finished work of christ we ask you to give us uh, a sense of how you died specifically for your people, that you died for us. Uh, please help us to know that blessed relationship, a personal relationship to Christ our Savior. We ask in Christ's name.